standard treatment book label. There's two parts. What's up, everybody? I'm the Hook. And I'm the Blade. And I'm here. Uh, together we're, y- you know, welcome to the Hook Brother Bladehood, a show about all things Assassin's Creed Brotherhood. I'm your host, Lawson, and with me, as always, is my co-host, Tim. And we are joined this week by a guest host, Jacers, formerly known as Jacers Hobbs 018. Nice to be here, guys. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate that you changed your name because I always felt like saying Jacers Hab 018 on the podcast. It kind of sounds like, do you remember when musicians in the 70s would like put coded messages backwards <laughs> in their songs? Yeah. 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 You, wait, you're meaning they stopped doing that already? Like I was worried that if, if someone played backwards that like Jacers Hab 018 would be like, help me Satan or something like that. I don't know. <laughs> no, no, there's nothing. No, I usually say 018, but... Help me, I'm being forced to make movement guides. <laughs> <laughs> I'm being held at gunpoint, guys. My back is stiff from being squi- uh I can't talk. Squat- squatted in this position all day. Squatted? Oh, you don't have a chair? Squatted. No, not squatted. What's sc- I've developed arthritis from Assassin's Claw. <laughs> <laughs> I've been holding the high profile button too much. My finger barely moves anymore. Uh. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, Jacers does a lot of really cool videos about parkour and stealth and combat and generally just like getting the most out of the mechanics in Assassin's Creed games. I really enjoy uh, your videos, Jacers, because I feel like you have this very analytical approach to playing Assassin's Creed where, where you figured out kind of how to optimize all of the systems that they give you especially in those older games. Yeah, for sure. Um, those games definitely allow for um, a much higher skill ceiling than what we have, um, especially in the later two games. But even stuff like AC3, AC4, even Unity to some extent, although Unity does increase the skill ceiling a bit, but f- both for good reasons and bad ones, because, you know, yeah. just the state that game was in. But yeah, um, <laughs> th- that's just something I appreciate about these games is, I come into these games, I want to feel like a Brotherhood Assassin, and a Brotherhood Assassin needs to feel, you know, elite. They're highly trained. They have spent their whole life training for this moment, and they should be able to get shit done when they put their minds to it. And that's something that I, that's a big part of the player fantasy for me. So being able to do all this cool stuff and be extremely effective when I play these games, that's just something I always strive for, so... And that's totally. that's something I try to portray on my channel is this is like a cool cinematic thing. This is what you can do with these games. Essentially, that's what I try to show off. We right. recently made like the, the movement guide for Unity that I really enjoyed because I felt like it put the the system in terms that helped me like really understand why it is the way it is. When you said that the earlier games were kind of the parkour system was driven by button presses. And that in Unity, it's more movement driven. It's about where you're pointing your stick. It's about how your camera is positioned. Like, that makes so much sense to me. I mean, there's definitely something to be said, too, about when you happen to talk or do videos and like older games, you do preface it with saying like even even the former games, which, like, like you say, have very precise systems. A lot of the things are kind of hidden underneath. Yes. And aren't very intuitive. And I think it says a lot that you mention these things because it's definitely very easy to be like, well, I understand it. So why don't you? Yeah, exactly. When the game doesn't tell you. Yeah. um, So we're going to we're going to link your channel in the description of this podcast. So people who want to check out your stuff can do so. And I highly recommend that you do um, because they're they're very enjoyable to watch. And I just I just really dig the sort of technical evaluations of of gameplay systems. But this episode. It's not about that. This is an episode about Assassin's Creed Brotherhood. My favorite (laughs) game. Right, so yeah, this is your number one game in the franchise, right? Yes, uh, this is my absolute favorite game in the entire franchise. And then I think last week when we were talking about rankings, Brotherhood was, Tim, that was your number three? Yeah, it was my number three. And for me, it was like, what, number... It was probably... I think seven... Seven, six or seven six? yeah yeah it was that low i don't remember it being that low so it was somewhere well that's basically middle of the road so it was the same place you ranked syndicate right okay yeah 
And so for me, yeah, it is kind of middle of the road, but, but I, interestingly, and this is what I want to stress, my ranking got lower after this most recent replay. Oh yeah. Some games after the replay, AC one and brotherhood both got lower and revelations, which we're going to talk about next week, got higher on the ranking for me. Oh yeah. I mean, so like what, what are the things that make brotherhood your favorite game? in the franchise okay first of all i need to address is the movement system i love the parkour in assassin's creed one to revelations my favorite yeah. iteration of it is as lawson you might get angry at me for this but i actually really love the way it's implemented in ac1 because of how little the game handholds or how little altair handholds because you have to, <laughs> you have to aim them directly at the handhold well that, that's something i appreciate right that's <laughs> I appreciate the game forcing me to grab things on purpose. I, that's AC1, something... I think, is very, like, it's very similar <laughs> to the other games in terms of movement. He just, he's very slow to scale yeah. a building. Yeah. Like, for, I for will literally fall asleep between the bottom and top of a, <laughs> of a tower. Yeah. I have done, here, here, I, I'll offer a quick, here's the difference between your approach and my approach to AC1. You, you look at this. <laughs> You look at the climbing and you say, okay, the climbing is slow. This sucks, right? Yeah. <laughs> and I say, okay, yeah, the climbing is slow. That's annoying. How do I get around that? So then I basically, I just look around and I, because I've talked about movement optimization, all these different things, because that's just the mindset I have going into these games. And that's fair. And, if you like and, rely on ladders and parkour starters, you'll have yeah, better time. Yeah, because realistically, or even just like standard ejects, like basically... The extent of the wall scaling I do in AC1 is literally just the initial wall run, and then I'm almost always already ejecting somewhere. Like, it's very rare that I actually just straight up climb a build a building in AC1. I, I understand the flaws. Like, I do appreciate the addition of high-profile climb in Ezio's games. It's a it's a big addition, because a lot of people don't know this, but you can actually just climb, or not. I don't know about don't know, but people don't think about this but you can climb just like ac1 in ac2 you just have to let go of high profile i don't know why yeah. you choose to do that but you can so yeah i think it also just for me it it, it we can have a we can have a fist fight about ac1 after right. the show's so <laughs> chasers enough about ac1 that's not what we're talking about today so brotherhood <laughs> well yeah definitely with brotherhood you know the strengths of brotherhood and the reason that i understand why brotherhood ranks so highly for many people which i think as we saw on our on the people who commented and tweeted ranking lists at us brotherhood is generally in people's top three at least yeah the thing that's great about brotherhood and it's exactly how i feel every time i start playing it is like wow i'm playing ac2 but better yeah i'm playing ac2 but the the free running feels nicer the combat feels nicer everything just has this layer of polish yes and, and perfection yes. to it that's that's something I definitely appreciate about Brotherhood is that obviously the parkour is amazing, just like in terms of a system, it's you snap to certain objects in a way that's less like you don't fall off of things as easily. You don't have to catch ledge on like just what should be simple landings. Sometimes it can look a little janky, but I appreciate the improvements in terms of quality of life. Brotherhood keeps those things, but it also speeds up. Like Ezio is noticeably faster in Brotherhood than in AC2. And then Tim, what was your what? What are the things that that Brotherhood does to earn its place on your list? Look, I mean, and here's the thing: is I think similarly on this replay, like you and I had similar like sobering feelings about it. We we had some qualms. So for me, it it's number three because. It still represents a lot of classic AC stuff that I miss while yeah. like, for instance, like I had a much better time playing Black Flag than I did Brotherhood. But if I'm ranking my definitive AC list, Brotherhood can't go below Black Flag just because of my principles. Yeah. So that makes sense. while I have much more of a fun, enjoyable time with Black Flag, if it was just based off of that, Black Flag would probably be in brotherhood spot gotcha. so hmm. brotherhood is three because i still think it represents a lot of classic ac gameplay that i that i miss and i think could be done better nowadays yeah, um but sure. i do have i do have issues with it and uh who knows maybe as we continue this replay that we're doing it it'll shift totally hmm. my my thing with brotherhood and and what makes it a really interesting game to me is that i feel like there are some contradictions about it like there are things that work really well on one level and don't work at all on another level. Like, for example, okay, 
the systems of the game that are secondary to, you know, your pillars of combat, parkour, and stealth, the systems being things like your assassin recruit system or the Rome global economy, they're, they're really fun and they really extend your ability to kind of have a role playing immersive feel when you play the game. Like you can really put yourself in the, in the, in the role of like renovating the city of, of mentoring a group of assassins. But at the same time, if you really invest yourself into these systems and you try to maximize the depth and, and richness of their effect on your gameplay, like they're going to kill the pacing of your, of your playthrough because every time you complete a mission in the main story, you're going to then have to spend some time putzing around with menus so that you can renovate buildings and you can send assassins on missions. They're really kind of artificially extending the amount of time that you have to sink into the game with things that are expressly yeah. not gameplay. They're not the thing you came to the game to do. So that's one contradiction, right? The systems are fun, yeah. but they're often superfluous and kill the pacing. When when I want to talk about the game design of Brotherhood, that's another interesting contradiction because on one hand, there's so much to love in the sense that Brotherhood, more so than any other game in the series, really takes this approach of finding opportunities in the world to create puzzles and gameplay. When you have to find something or or even just climbing a viewpoint tower, you have to think so much more about it than in any other game. And I love that. But then you start playing the actual missions and some of the mission design in this game is fucking horrible, like straight up horribly Which bad. Which one were you? Could you give an example? I'm yeah, curious. totally, totally, yeah. totally. Um, oftentimes you'll fail a mission by breaking a rule that you didn't know was there. Like, for yeah. example, you'll get in trouble for alerting a guard when the only rule that they told you was was you know no desync or or yeah. failing for killing enemies before the game wants you to kill them. I got stopped yeah. more times by breaking rules that were not communicated to me than any other problem. Is that like an actual desync, or you just fail the full sync? An actual desync. Okay. The main mission that only set like that really stands out to me that I had a bad experience with was the one where you're tailing. I think it was Micheletto before the the uh, the play where you they try and kill the guy who's like the guy who's uh, having an affair with Lucrezia. Um, that yeah. mission really stood out to me as really bad because. It's just a super fucking long tailing yeah. mission. And there's no, like, tailing missions, the, like, the ones in the main story in AC2 are good because you're hearing them talk, like, the main villains, and you actually get, like, there's something interesting happening. But yeah. this tailing mission, you're just following a dude all around the map for seemingly no fucking reason. And then there's also the full sync where you have to use the assassin recruit. This is just the Terry on top, by the way. There's, there, there's a full sync where you have to use the assassin recruits to because i i side note i i full synced brotherhood for my playthrough to talk so about did I. I full synced it yeah i full um, synced and i 100 percent of the game so i did all the side missions and all the okay. collectibles so i for the full sync for this mission was to have your recruits um assassinate all the people that you needed to take out yeah but my recruits thought it'd be funny to kill the people with throwing knives on one of them and i lost the full sync yeah even though they stayed undetected they just whipped a bunch of throwing knives and killed the guys it's like, okay, well, thanks for that. I think full syncing introduces even more of these kinds of like snags in the gameplay than, than it already has. But I'm thinking of like, there's a, the mission where there's kind of like a gondola. You're tailing a boat through this, through this tunnel system where you have to get to the gates. And that, oh, that was I, the, the, the boat war machine. With yeah. The, the, that one I failed fire. a bunch of times for things that I really didn't think were my fault. Then there are like mm. some of the missions at the Castello. We're, we're oh, had yeah. similar problems with jank like that, uh, especially if you're trying to full sync them. And then um, I don't ever have issues with them just because but I can't really compare to that because I've just like I can say that I'm very good at the game. So yeah. I can't I can't really easily say that it's I know how to avoid bad situations like that. That's another thing is that Assassin's sure. Creed to some degree has always had some kind of jank. And we we, we accepted this because one, the game's were what we wanted them to be in terms of like themes and aesthetics and things like that. And also they like it, people like me, like there's also added depth there. Sure. There's some janky mechanics, but you can do all this extra cool shit. So 
you can accept it because again, role playing, aesthetics, things that and, you want and, to achieve with. And the here's game. the other thing, like there was a mission that uh, you're following Bartolomeo and he's got like 20 uh, guards that you're following them all. And you have to then kill some, kill some guards between, do you know the mission I'm talking about? Yeah. Where you're surrendering to Baron Valois and then you yeah. have to like, and there's like three the little moments where it stops you and you have to kill those guards. That mission. Yeah. I don't know what it was, but it straight up just was broken for me. Like, huh? Like literally it didn't tell me that first of all, I had to wait for for those those guards to get there and for a timer to start because if if you killed one of those three targets in that area before the timer would start you desynced with no explanation as to why so that's that's huh. terrible design right right away that never happened was it like the three guards right at the front or yeah but but this oh, was oh. true every time i had the same problem because well yeah well because when i would because i i did what you i, I did what you did i went yeah. ahead because as soon as the marker comes up to me, it's 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 fair game. But what I noticed is even if I waited and just walked with the group, then low profile assassinated like the guy who's on the ground, it would desync me anyway. Huh. So my only solution was to go up on the roof and crossbow all of them. That's really weird. Huh. That's the one mission where sometimes I would get desynced literally without doing anything. Like I, I could just be walking between targets after the timer had already started. And I would get a desync. And the only thing I can assume is that it's like someone discovered a body in a haystack or something like that. But it's just it's really poor mission design. And I feel like while that's one very glaring example of it, that when I played Brotherhood again, the missions were full of awkwardness like that. Full of yeah, that's jank. really and that's maybe really if weird. I was like a, a deep expert of all of the game systems, I could have avoided all of that. But it's unfair to to really credit the game for for your skill i think i think it's yeah that i would rate the game on like how did it play for me as a person who is fairly good at the game i i understand the systems i, I play it well there's there's also plenty of full sync garbage like like that in terms of like there, there's a lot of unspecific full sync objectives where it's like don't kill anyone and so what i'll do is i'll go up behind yeah. someone with my fists and just incapacitate them and then it says, oh, you killed someone. It's like, OK, how about you just tell me you don't want me to hurt anyone? Don't initiate combat. Don't take out any enemies. Whatever. But just say something people, else yeah. that's less yeah. like that's more general than don't kill anyone, because obviously. Yeah. Yeah. And the worst part is how often you have to restart a mission from like the very beginning to full sync. Like, yeah, these full sync objectives would be much, much more manageable if I if could reload checkpoints. checkpoints. Yeah, but like, like when the I tank mission, Hell on Wheels, dude. When I got to Hell oh on Wheels, gosh. when I got to the tank mission, and I had never played it before on this playthrough, and I knew it was going to be a pain in the ass, but I was like, I was like, you know, whatever, I'll just, I'll, I'll try to experience this the way it was meant to be experienced. But the mission up until the point where you're actually in the tank is itself so long and such a pain in the ass that. As soon as I got in the tank, I like looked on YouTube, like, what is this mission actually going to be like so that I can be, you know, give it my best shot. And luckily I watched a video that showed you how to do the tank glitch where you, where you pull back out of the, um, you know, the memory wall, the yeah. memory wall in the first at the final area. And I was able to 100% hell on wheels on my first try ever when I played it, yeah. but I had I mean. to literally use a, an exploit to do that. You know, and if I didn't have that exploit, I probably would not have hundred percented it. And I would have had to do that mission like three or four times. I actually had a harder time with the flying machine one personally, but yeah, that I like that one, but it's like very unforgiving. I still like the flying mission. I just, I think the flying mission, like the lead up, I like the missions themselves in terms of like, okay, they incorporate parkour stealth and then, um, some oh, of them sure. combat for sure. And then they also throw in the set piece and in terms of just the missions themselves, if you take out the full sinks, I think those missions become enjoy more enjoyable for everyone yeah. across the board. Definitely. Because like even if you have a detection equals desync, that's still just like whatever. Like that you can have I can added work around challenges. That. Like you can Yeah. But it's like if you make one mistake in any of these things, you have to restart the entire thing and that's just so, like fuck you basically. Full sync objectives that's, that's, as an idea are are good. The worst. Terrible idea. Don't do it. I oh, think you don't like them at all. I think you could you could do a better version of it if, if it were completely different. I think that like my ideal vision of a full sync objective would be it tells me like a specific 
way to to complete a mission that is creative or interesting uh, on its own. So more like a black box mission from unity kind of thing. Exactly. Where it's like, Hey, yeah. you know, take out the, take out your target using this tool or this weapon or not even not, not even take out, but like, Hey, you can take out, do this. And this is like a more scripted. And it's like, the implication is that it's like, this is a more scripted thing with like unique yeah. elements, but you can also take this more creative approach and do things your own way. But that's uh, something I like, but, but yeah. So, so, the full sync objectives in Brotherhood, uh, I'm not a fan of. I'm not really a fan of them in any game, and AC3 they just does don't, them the worst. They don't enhance the experience whatsoever. I mean, they. I I don't do a full sync objective and think, wow, I I'm really glad I did that, or else I wouldn't have experienced the mission to the full to its fullest potential. No. In later games with the black box stuff, the full sync objectives become enhancements to the assassination. Yeah, and yeah. that is where they shine the most. In this mm-hmm. game, they're just chores. There yeah. are extra things that are going to take you away from the experience so that you can get an achievement or whatever, and it's bogus. I'm I'm glad they're gone. I'd rather have a game with dialogue options than full sync objectives. Controversial opinion. I'm not there yet. To go back to my point of like contradictions. Well, actually, not even I'm not even really going to do that. When you when you take those things in, into consideration for me, like all of the jank and the mission design all over the place how much the systems really start to feel like, especially if you're going for a hundred percent, that they're just distracting you from actually playing the game. And I, I actually, I think that's why they're there. I think that the only reason you get like a list of missions that just, that are just timers to level up your assassin recruits is because they know when they're making brotherhood, they can only do like nine sequences of actual content and they want you to be able to play it for a while. So, you know, going from AC2 with like 74 viewpoints to AC Brotherhood with 22, adding systems like this is a good way to actually make the game take longer, which it does. But it feels empty to me. It feels like actually just timer padding bullshit. It doesn't immerse me. It doesn't feel like actually it's tied to the gameplay at all. It's completely extraneous. In the main story, yeah. But like the way that they do the side content is like the exact opposite, though. Right. Which is like really interesting that it would be like polar opposites like that because the side content i think tim you made a reddit post about this a while ago it was yeah. like the side content in brotherhood the way it's done is the exact opposite of that but i'll let you finish what you're saying and and don't get me wrong i appreciate the side content quite a bit like like all of the missions that you have to do you know from war machines to the templar hunts um they're fun i don't think that like the thief missions or courtesan missions are particularly interesting i think those are kind of guff but it's certainly a lot better than ac2 like beat up my cheating husband or do this race you know kind of missions yeah i i still hold that this game does uh side content the the best it's there's definitely room for improvement it's not perfect yeah um there are even things that we'll talk about next week with revelations that i think does better but yeah i still think that brotherhood like the Leonardo missions are completely optional. You don't even have to touch them. For that to be a side content and it is, is, is really impactful to me because... Because they clearly took cinematic. a lot of time and resources to make those. Right, and you can completely avoid it. The Christina missions, you can completely avoid those and they give you so much context to AC2 stuff and they're beautiful. They're really They're great. Yeah. Well Christina missions are the best scenes. side content in maybe any Assassin's Creed game. 100%. So that's why I think it's the best side content and I... I I like the Yohalem brand of side content, at least in this context, that it's all connected to the overall goal. I'm not saying I always need that. Yeah. But it's nice to think that when I'm going around and killing Templar agents, they are people who are aiding the Borgia. When I go around and do these Romulus tombs, the Romulus people are working for the Borgia. It all makes sense as to why Ezio is concerning himself with these things. Right. And then there's like the Harlequins that you have to beat up around the city. Like... Why did Ezio go around Renaissance in Italy beating up clowns? <laughs> like I, that that doesn't make that much sense to me. That's like the one thing, but or like just a minor thing. But yeah. it's a great comparison point to something like Unity where it's like, why does Arno solve mysteries for people? There's no reason. Yeah. Right. Well, yeah, there's 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 no there's nothing that that, that connects Arno to the murder mysteries to the greater world of the game. Or there's even really like the Paris that. stories at all. Arno Arno is not some like self-professed detective you know like there's no, no he has no business being there. it's not part of his job yeah exactly so i like i agree on on the side content thing 
And honestly, all of this stuff, like the systems and the design issues, they wouldn't be that big of a deal to me at, at the end of the day if it weren't for one thing, one big thing, okay? That's my biggest problem with Brotherhood. I, I don't know about what you guys think, but I, I think the story fucking sucks. Yeah, I'm with I, you on I that I agree one. it has problems. Fucking. I agree it has problems. Sucks. I don't even remember what happened, honestly, in it at this point. <laughs> it like it's so superfluous it it really feels like the, it it concerns itself with things that are so meaningless like the the bulk of the story is is going to is is built around Ezio working with the the group of allies from the first game you know the volpe M machiavelli more so and like as far as character drama goes or actual like stakes go the cesare and the borgias at large are pretty like intangible threats Absence. other than, you know, like as Tim pointed out to me once, I'm pretty sure after Monte uh, you, you don't interact directly with Cesare until the very end of the game. And yeah. And Cesare himself yeah. is not a particularly well-drawn character. He's pretty much just a shouty asshole. Like he's just shouting yeah, all mean, the time heard... and he wants world domination. Why? Because, it's a it's a Yohalem AC yeah. villain. He wants to you know. He's a everyone. very yeah. He's he he's a mustache twirling Yohalem villain, and you don't even directly interact with Cesare at the Monteregioni. It's just those are the, like that's the one scene where they're at least in like the same like camera angle, <laughs> the same zip code, you know? Yeah, right. Yeah, the, yeah, the, the the same area code. You know, it's like. By the way, speaking of Monteregioni, though, aside from all of the story's faults, yeah, the beginning Monteregioni bit is such a strong opening. To, to, yeah. to an AC game. For sure. I'd agree with that. For sure. I like, even like thinking about it in the context of like mechanically, like, oh, I just rode a horse into a city. I haven't been able to do yes. that in any of yes. these first two games. And another thing is the graphics, right? AC2, like, like you, I th you guys mentioned this, it like very much looks like a game of its time. But Brotherhood, I had to argue, is aged a lot better. Brotherhood still so looks things great. So things just look a lot cleaner. And like you, you see all these different things and then to have that meld up with, holy shit, this entire place that I spent the last game spending thousands and thousands of Florins building up just got nuked basically. Exactly. Is, and it's gone. Everything I spent the entire last game working on is gone. That when I first played Brotherhood, my jaw hit the damn floor. Yeah. Like that was well, so good. Also too, another trick that they pull is they make it seem like you're going to save Monteregioni. Like the like yeah. they, 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 they they give you some hope when you get to the cannons. Yeah. And it's like, all right, yeah. just kill as just, many people as you just can. Like, them and like then you we'll think be fine. That there's some hope. Yeah. Right. And all but also it's so perfectly set up about how like you practice with the cannons earlier. Like I yeah. feel like the earlier missions with I'm on Regione with the cannons and with the citizens and stuff, I feel like they trick you into thinking that Mono Regione is still gonna be the base. Yeah. And brotherhood and like Mario's taking care of the apple so that it's safe or he just has it in his pocket. Right. And Ezio is always saying, oh, my ba my battles are done now. I don't have to fight anymore. Yeah, they do the classic sequel trick of having that intro where everything's fine. And we're yeah. all happy and everything's good. And then, oh, there comes the bad guy. But let me let me yeah. pose a counterpoint to you, Timothy. Yeah. As the although I, I love the Monteregioni opening and it's very exciting and it's a great set piece, a great set piece. It's more comparable, like if we're talking about openings, like if you look at AC2, you know, obviously the, the siege in Monteregioni isn't the first thing in the game. There's there's a whole sequence of having to help out around the, the town before it gets attacked. Right. AC2 is the same uh -huh. way you have to help your family and then, then they get attacked. Um, yeah, the, the killing of Ezio's family in terms of his, his father and his brothers is a much more emotionally impactful starting point and has effects that ripple throughout the game story wise than Brotherhood, uh, where pretty much the only lasting consequence other than not having Monteregioni is that your uncle's dead. And they, they try to make that yeah. be the same thing. But interestingly enough, even though I had a whole game to care about, about Mario, I didn't really care after he died in this game that he was dead. And I, I I can't explain exactly why that is, but I have always cared that, you know, his father and brothers died. I always felt imp like impacted by that. And I think that partially is because there's the injustice element in AC2. There's the fact that that this is a betrayal directly by a, f a family friend 
Whereas in in yeah. AC two, it's just a shouty bad guy skewering your uncle. Uh, sorry, Brotherhood. But they try to reference it multiple times throughout Brotherhood. Like we have to do this for Uncle Mario. That wasn't emotionally engaging to me the way AC two was. So better yeah. intro in terms of you know spectacle, absolutely. In terms of like creating emotional stakes that will power the rest of the story, not at all. Well, I think I think in terms of if if okay, so if Brotherhood's intro happened and AC two didn't happen at all, like it wouldn't it wouldn't nearly be as impactful. Totally, a, a huge a huge part of why it's so impactful to me is because I spent all my time bringing up Monteriggioni and they just they and they crush it and you know it's definitely like an easy way to to get an emotional response out of someone. I, uh, so yeah, obviously like the Ezio's family stuff is it's, it's classic. And I'm not saying this necessarily overtakes it because still to this day, it, the ramifications of that are felt throughout the story. Yeah. But my, my counterpoint to your counterpoint is if they had made Mario's like of like, uh, the avenging of Mario, if they had made it more impactful in the story, I think you'd have a different feeling about the opening. I think that's probably true. Cause again, I'm talking purely in terms of like, how did it affect me emotionally? And like, yeah, seeing the, the, the villa get destroyed is, is it does work. Like the effect they were going for was achieved, but I like, I didn't hate Cesare the way the game clearly wants me to hate Cesare. You know, sure. I, and also what I would what I would say to you as well is like, I, like, I, I don't think I, I, and I, I know this isn't what you're saying. I just don't think that like every opening needs to have like like a like a gut wrenching like death. Oh, no. You know, or like no. anything like that. So like yeah. even if Mario wasn't killed and, and I, I know, that's in not fact, the point you're making. that's part of my it's, problem with it is that it feels like a cheap like, ah, oh, who can we kill? Yes. Ah, Mario. Right. Yeah. No. And yeah. And I, and I. I agree with you. And I, I'm really glad that they didn't go as far as like kill kill Claudia or something. You know. Yeah. yeah like just sure. imagining um, that they kill Claudia would make me sad. You know. Here's here's an interesting like point too. Is is to my knowledge in the Brotherhood book, uh, it goes further to like where Mario's head is put on a pike, oh, and wow. Ezio can yeah. see the pike from like as he's fleeing. So. Damn. There's definitely more they could have done with 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 the opening for sure, but I think it's just it's it's a great set piece, it's a great spectacle, and I always feel like helpless, like Ezio does, yeah. because he comes mm -hmm. back and like everyone loves him. He's he's like a, he's like he's like this mythical hero to to the citizens. Yeah, yeah, he can and instantly then, sleep with that girl. Like he gets whoever. Whatever yes, he and wants. then everything falls apart the next morning. You know, yeah, he he he's just bedded Katarina Sforza, the girl he spent the entire first like not first game. He spent all of AC two practically lusting over her essentially. Like like the any time he's with her, what did, what did he call her to Leonor? He said, "My next conquest." Yep, that's my next conquest. Yeah, my next so conquest. He, yeah, he had that set up. For, I I cannot do an Ezio voice if I try, so I'm not even gonna bother embarrassing try myself. Try and do it. it. We appreciate it. Uh, let me see. What does Leonor? <laughs> I'm trying to think what Leonardo says first so I can... Uh, I'm way better at doing an older Ezio than a young Ezio is the problem, right? Because when he says that, he's like, what? Like Just stop talking 20s. and do an Ezio impression, you doofus. My next conquest. <laughs> it's not It's great. not great, but it's not the worst I've ever heard. Yeah, I'm sure it could be worse. Um, the worst I've ever heard is Ezio in AC Chronicles China. Xiao <laughs> <laughs> Yun! <Ugh. laughs> Yeah, that's not great. Um. Anyway, so brother, so look. Yeah. I mean, yeah. The the villain. I think actually, if Cesare was a more interesting villain, that would have, that would have been the easiest way to to make the story better. But all sure, of the yeah. side drama sure. between like, ooh, La Volpe thinks Machiavelli might be a a, a traitor. Claudia and Ezio aren't getting along because he doesn't want her to run the brothel. Like, it's all very much like it feels very secondary and, and it's not very easy to get invested in actually caring about the outcomes of these stories. And they pretty much are forgotten for the most part. Like they all get resolved. There's, you know, Claudia kills a bunch of people and then Ezio decides to respect her. You know, Machiavelli ends up not being the traitor because it was actually just a thief with uh, one of the generic thief models. 
So like, honestly, yeah. you know, pretty, pretty bad story. All things considered for me. And the, the story is my number one consideration when it comes to an Assassin's Creed game. You can, you can be, you know, ha- have great gameplay and, and, and feel awesome to play. And if the story is weak, it's, it's not going to make my top three. Fair enough. It's also quite annoying. It, it, all of that, what you're saying, is compounded by the fact that Ezio is perfect and awesome. Yeah, I mean, AC2, he already is a, a flawless character, but he at least has some adversity, some struggles that he's facing. Whereas uh, Brotherhood, especially when he makes mistakes, which does happen pretty often, it's like there's never any consequences for those mistakes. He never does anything. Or at least the game doesn't show them. That, yeah. that people are like actually angry with him for. And, and I get that what they were going for with Ezio and all of his games is a power fantasy. Like the idea is we're supposed to want to play as Ezio because he's perfect. But I think, you know, we've, we've kind of moved past that in the years since that all action games have to have a character insert sort of situation. And Ezio manages to be charming and, and likable and empathetic despite the fact that he is a power fantasy self-insert character. It's just that Brotherhood stretches that a little bit, where he's still perfect and everyone still loves him no matter what, even though he's fucking up sometimes. Yeah, I think the only person that actually gives him any shit is Machiavelli, yep. which is which I think I that's why I appreciate his character so much, is he's the only person that really openly disagrees with Ezio, other than maybe La Volpe a little bit when talking about Machiavelli specifically. But um, in general, Machiavelli even like he even says it to his face is like, you and I don't agree on many counts or whatever, something to that tune. Right? Yeah. But then he says that's he calls Ezio the lead, the best, like exactly what they need. But also, yeah, that. doesn't he kind like, of it, yeah. as soon as as soon as uh, when Machiavelli is like, we don't agree on everything, but also you're the best assassin ever. And, and, <laughs> and, and here's the leadership position. Like, yeah, I don't know. It's just like the conflict is kind of just deflated at that point because throughout the entire time, Machiavelli is giving him shit. Even at the beginning of the game, he's like, you dumbass, you let Rodrigo live. Yeah. And they also try and yeah. retroactively make his decision AC2 a smart one by him saying, killing one man would not have solved all of this. And it's like, you didn't know that at the time, you fuck. <laughs> you, you had no idea. So stop <laughs> acting like you did. Yeah. Anyway. No, I think, yeah, that's Ezio's hubris on display, I think. That's something that the game glosses over, I think, like in terms of display and like it doesn't really show that that much. But Ezio is a very proud character, like to a fault. And that's one of his big issues as a character. Like what's one of his character it, flaws? Not it would like, have been great, though, if there were if there were consequences or, or change for that. Like, yeah. like if Brotherhood's story was about him overcoming his hubris, that'd be great. Uh, you know, set up for revelations as this wiser and older it, version of himself. Well, there's part of that in his conflict with Claudia, right? Because his hubris is, I need to protect my sister. That's what he's thinking. Like, I need to be the one to protect my family. But then yeah. he's worried about whatever. Yeah, yeah it's not great. It's, it's there. I don't know if it if it really has much to do with his hubris is the thing. Like, he's protecting her hmm. or he's he's trying to protect her theoretically. At the same yeah. time, it's it's really what it is, is that when they were writing those scenes, they want there to be conflict because... You know, when we when we're when we're witnessing a story unfold, if there's not conflict happening, we're like, wait, what's the story? And so yeah. they felt like by having him have this disagreement with Claudia over whether or not she should insert him herself, that yeah. should be a conversation that as soon as she's like, I don't care what you think, I'm gonna do it anyway, like there's no no point in still like glaring at her in every conversation scene you have after that. Which is what happens yeah. until he sees that she's defended herself, and then he's like, "I knew you could do it." And she's like, <laughs> I, "She's like, my sister knows how to wield a knife." See, I can kill people too, brother. And then their mom is like, "Finally, you guys have stopped fighting." And it's like, "What was all this about anyway? What was the point?" What an effective character res- character argument resolution. Ten out of ten, guys. <laughs> Thank you very much. There's also just there's just not much that fucking happens in the story to begin with. There's not much that happens at all. And so, you know, I, I, I think that's a consequence of all this shit is like it feels like a lot happens in the story. But like there's like two actual assassinations. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. That's something I noticed. 
That's something I noticed like when the I went banker, back. Like, okay. The banker, you would yeah. like you just found out about the dude. You just found out he exists, and then you go and kill him. Yeah. There's no like preemptiveness to any of these decisions. Ezio is just going with the flow, and he never makes a wrong decision, you know? And it's just it's just there's not much meat on these bones for the story. And I think, as you mentioned, Lawson, it's because it was made in a very short period of time. I also think, yeah. too, that like you know, I'm big on the idea of how can your story and your gameplay make each other stronger. And I remember we were looking at, I looked at this interview with, I want to say, uh, Maxime Belland, um, or Bellend, because he's actually a serial abuser, harasser at Ubisoft, um, where he's talking about Brotherhood and he's like, you know, this isn't Assassin's Creed 2.5. It's, it's a new game. It's a new story. It's about Ezio training uh, the next generation of assassins. But the way you do that is you send them away in many like menus and shit. Right. The like, story is not about that, obviously. He just didn't want to say that the story is not about yeah. anything because it isn't. But um, that's an easy way to sell a game about managing the Brotherhood. I would have wanted to see that be the story if that was the case. Like, what if some of the assassins in your group of recruits were the supporting characters in the story and he had to build an, yeah. a brotherhood where there wasn't one, but because his entire brotherhood follows him from Florence to Venice to, to Roma, it's not a really about starting a new brotherhood or, or, or anything like that. It's just the brotherhood is there now. You know what I mean? So like, that's a good point. Lassa, because I often praise brotherhood for utilizing the supporting cast, but at the same time, if Machiavelli or Bartolomeo or the Volpe or, Cl or Claudia or like didn't follow you there, that would have forced you to put people in those positions of power yourself. And it would have forced you to create new characters that you could have gotten invested in and cared more about, right. you know, it would have helped if because like there's only one mission that I believe in the main story where the assassins actually accompany you. A lot yeah. of the main story doesn't have anything to do with with, with the assassins that you're training. They're just all delegated to menus into like a little cutscene when they go become a master assassin. Yeah. They're not really involved in the main story at all. No, definitely not. And even, well, we'll talk about Revelations. But yeah, I mean, th like if, if this game was written around the idea that Ezio is now a mentor and what does that mean for the story could have been a lot more interesting. But I think that they wanted yeah, to, sure. I think because it was, it was thrown together and it kind of has like DLC energy as, as the story goes that it was easier to just bring over the supporting cash from the last game and give them something different to do. But you know, there's only so much you can do with that. And there's only so much you can do with their, their characters at this point. Yeah. I always, I always thought it would, be, would, would have been fun as well as if there are like specific assassin missions that you can go on with your assassin recruits. Yeah. Even if, even like if revelations, it's, even if it's just in the main map of Rome, I thought it'd be neat if you could go with your assassin recruits to go do certain missions that were exotic or whatever. And obviously it would take a bigger team and a bigger game to do such things. Yeah. If they ever brought the yeah. system back, I think that'd be cool. But also it would give you the sense of like com camaraderie with specific assassins, not just because they're, they're kind of faceless. Yeah. They mm -hmm. don't feel like people. They just feel like, because also, I don't think it'd be smart for them just to never die and be invincible. But the fact that they can die and you'll just go recruit another asshole, I don't know if that makes like because they're so interchangeable and expendable, yeah. it doesn't make them feel like a part of the world like a lot of the other stuff does. Does that make sense? Yeah, and I guess yeah, if definitely. I could put a button on on a lot of the the story problems we're we're discussing here, it would be that like Brotherhood feels like AC2 table scraps. That's a good way to put it, yeah. Yeah. It's just needs it's a solid foundation, but like it just needed to be expanded upon to actually be something a bit more like like a yeah, full meal a bit more like to continue Lawson's. Meaningful. Yeah. Right now it's an appetizer. Yeah. It needs to be an entree. The story -wise, it's like yeah. a little dessert that you eat after AC2. It's like, here's another little Ezio yeah. adventure. It does kind of feel like a DLC to me. Yeah, and then you have one thing. I think you might have mentioned this in a previous episode. Where we were talking about Cesare, this to backtrack yeah. a little bit, but talking about his involvement. Something, even though syndicates like Crawford Sterrick is extremely must-out, like he literally shoots one of his own dudes for no fucking yeah. reason. Uh -huh. He... 
you see his reaction to everything. Like at the end of every yep. sequence, you see something from him, even yep. though he's not immediately present in all the story. He's still memorable because you recognize him. And I'm not saying Cesare isn't memorable because like he is just because um, the way that the game, tr- even though he's not there, like the way everything kind of revolves around him and the scenes he in, the voice actor absolutely nails it. Like every line Cesare has is really well done. I don't know. I feel so, like he's just shouting. Th- that's all. Like, the same voice actor played well, uh, yeah, Francesco but... de Pazzi in uh, AC2, and it's the same deal yeah. with that character. It's like, you will die yeah. by my blade! It's like, okay, dude, calm down. Drink a fresca. <laughs> okay. I, I like that. I like that in Cesare Borgia, but I don't know. That's Maybe that's just me. Yeah, Jacers, I do... I do completely agree. Like, one of the strong things about Syndicate is that Crawford Steric has his own little cutscenes every other sequence or whatever. That's not present with Cesare because as you're going through the main story, you know, there's a lot of stuff that is kind of tutorial for the other systems in the game. But yeah. you don't see, like, for instance, there's an instance in the Costello when you are racing towards the Apple and so is Cesare and you guys run into each yeah. other. That's the first time that the characters see each other in person to the point where Cesare just calls him Assassini. He doesn't even say Ezio. Yeah. Like you, they should be like, they should have already fought each other or interacted with each other like twice before that moment. Yeah. Because the inciting incident should have been him saying, this is a gift from my family to yours. And then they should have interacted when maybe when Ezio first gets to Rome and then he gets his ass kicked and he realizes he needs help. And then he interacts with them again. And then they have the Costello interaction. Oh, and by the way, the in medias res opening sequence of the game where, where it flashes forward to you fighting uh, Cesare at the end of the game. Uh huh. Super useless. Yeah. <laughs> like just completely like there to kind of just make you think that there's a story. Well, it's to make you think yeah. that like you and Cesare are like fucking lifelong enemies or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like, it's just, it's all the illusion of depth in this story. It's, it's, it's what everything is. Yeah. I, I just, I, I guess to put a button on that, my biggest problem with Cesare is like, I once, I think it's the banker assassination where Cesare is giving like a little speech and it's like, I realized in this playthrough, like I know nothing about this guy yeah. at all. I know nothing about this character. Why, like, why do I, why should I care? Yeah. Why does Ezio care? You know, like Rodrigo is taking a backseat. You know, he, he, he's a big threat too. Anyway, long story short, I just feel like if we would have met with Cesare multiple times and gotten more interactions with him and spent less time, like let the side content be side content. Yeah. There shouldn't be, there shouldn't be too much of the main story that's taken up with just tutorializing the side content. Yeah. Basically. Damn. Yeah. I think that's a pretty good, I think we covered most, if not all of the main things to talk about. The yeah. Story. I think the story we've, we've well covered now. Did we talk about combat mechanics specifically? No, not at all. Or? Okay. Yeah. So that's something that people often like to criticize about Brotherhood and a big change from AC2 because, you know, the main thing was the introduction of the kill chain mechanic, yeah. which is actually pretty controversial these days. Yeah. Lots of people talk about, um, you know, it's too easy. And I, yes, it is easy. But here's my thing with Brotherhood. And this is like, again, personal preference. You don't have to agree with me with this at all. But the way I look at Assassin's Creed games is I'm a Brotherhood assassin. A Brotherhood assassin doesn't do damage. A Brotherhood assassin applies kill effect to target hostile, right? So when I play Brotherhood, I feel as lethal as a Brotherhood assassin should. But my main problem with that is that Ezio is a fucking <laughs> tank when you have yeah. armor on him. I can, I can be fine with having pe- enemies die fast. But in, in Brotherhood and Revelations and even AC3 to Rogue to some extent is you're a tank and you can take hits all day long unless you purposefully avoid putting on armor like I do. One for visuals and two because that way there's actually some yeah. kind of challenge. That's my main issue is Ezio just takes too many hits when like if, if he can kill people in one hit, he should be able to die in one or two hits. Like, But other than that, like the new mechanics they added, kill chains... Um, combo kills. They added different weapons. I had I had mixed feelings about the kill streak for exactly the reasons you mentioned of it feeling like it makes things too easy, but I did feel like it made things more fun. 
Like just doing the kill streaks yes. was was always pretty satisfying, and it's also pretty well implemented Definitely. too. So I yes, I almost yes. want to say that it's my favorite combat in the series so far, but. It's definitely something I consider to be, if not my favorite, one of my favorites. What's interesting is like when you compare it to other combat in the franchise, it's never really that challenging outside of maybe AC1, you know, maybe AC2. Like if we're going to compare Brotherhood combat to like 3, 4 Rogue, I'll take Brotherhood any day of the week. They're all easy, but Brotherhood has a lot more depth to it. Whereas, you know, three, four rogue, it's pretty much just counter button city. When you look at like unity, it's, it's all jank. When you look at syndicate, it's literally yeah. piss. You just fucking hit the X button and they die. And then you look at origins and, Ro- and odyssey where it's all this hit box damage sponge thing where a single enemy will take longer to kill than the Cesare boss fight in brotherhood. Yeah, that's bad. <laughs> that's not fun. Brotherhood. And I guess also revelations would be the most fun implementation of combat in the series, in my opinion. But I think I would give it to Brotherhood over Revelations because of the, you know, ease of the double kill or not double kill. Yeah, double kill system. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I I think I'd give it to Brotherhood over Revelations, too. I also like in Brotherhood. Another thing is this is just a really simple thing. But in Brotherhood, the the combat is just faster than Revelations. Like Ezio just does things faster. So... It also like even though there's like you can complain that enemies are just standing around watching. <laughs> this is always it's, true. Yeah, there's there's less of that in Brotherhood just because things take like your kill animations don't yeah. take as long. That's that's one thing. It's also also Brotherhood was the first game to introduce multiplayer. Yes. Oh, holy shit! How do we not talk about that yet? I've never played it. <laughs> that's like I've never played either, but that's because I played the Assassin's Creed game for the first time. I played Brotherhood for the first time like twenty. 19 yeah. so yeah i guess i'm i guess i'm the only one in here right now that has played That's it it's a true veteran of <laughs> multiplayer ac okay so brotherhood's multiplayer is good um but revelations is the best version of it in my opinion and i've played all the different versions of the pvp i quite enjoyed brotherhood it's just revelations just has like this polish to it but yeah i just i really enjoy like i i honestly i don't know why the fuck they haven't brought it back for a battle royale scenario because it's perfect. You are trying to kill someone and you're trying to hide from the person trying to kill you. Yeah, I don't mean to ramble on too long about the multiplayer. It's just it's 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 a lot of fun and it sucks that they they dropped it. Yeah. My only other things that I really had as complaints about Brotherhood it, besides the big things like story combat gameplay, one is kind of specific because I I played the game on uh I, I used Uplay Plus to get the game, so I ended up having all of the DLC and all of the extras and stuff, which was nice. Um, I finally found the the Draken armor, I guess you would call it. I don't know how it's actually pronounced. Draken, Dra- oh, Drachen, yeah. Draken. I'll say Draken. Very cool armor. Love the way it looks. I put it on at the very beginning of the game, and um, the only problem is, for whatever reason, when you use the Draken armor, uh, it covers everything no matter what in any cutscene and in any disguise part of the game <laughs> so for the number of missions where you're supposed to be wearing a disguise you still have the dragon armor on which i didn't understand at first like i think there's that mission at the what the pantheon uh where you yeah luigi you literally walk out yeah you literally walk luigi. out the front door and they're like ah luigi there you are and i'm just chilling in my fucking Ezio clothes <laughs> but the worst part by far yeah, that's... is the Christina missions, because you're supposed to oh, be yeah. AC2 Ezio in his young boy clothes and, and voice, <laughs> but I'm I'm chilling there with the full outfit and full beard of Brotherhood era <laughs> Ezio, and his like teenager voice is coming out. <laughs> oh, Christina, my family is dead. Yeah. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci, yeah, that's, I am in your debt. <laughs> That is mildly immersion breaking to I, say the least. I didn't even really know until I was talking about it with Tim that I was supposed to be wearing different clothes the whole game in those in those yeah, moments. Yeah, because you told me you were like seeing young Ezio voice come out of uh, old Ezio doesn't really make any sense. And I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> like what? Like what are you seeing? <laughs> and then he explained it to me. Yeah, because for me, you know, because I didn't wear the dragon armor, I just went back to uh, middle uh, to, yeah. t- to teenage Ezio. 
which I can't stress enough are such great missions. And I'm kind of happy they got cut from AC2 because they made this, they, they're better in this. In they're this much kind better of way. in the context of context, being flashbacks yeah. than they would have been if they were just actually mixed into your timeline at the appropriate moments. 100%. Really well done. It's just, it's a shame because there's plenty of room you could see like for for brotherhood story to be better and there's also like there's a there's a moment where katarina like confesses that she only slept with him because she needed his like political power and he is clearly bummed out about it and then it's just like you know it's like great you know like Ezio finally isn't like this irresistible person to someone yeah. let's play with that and then he just fucking they it's just it's, it's forgotten about he just it, moves you know? on in fact he even sings yeah. a song about her in revelations when he's disguised as the bard sure does <laughs> i which, love which is that fun scene. that's the point but of he's also missions. the point of the song is like i didn't care because i got some you know what i mean yeah yeah it's just like whatever. Yeah. But, so uh, those those songs are great. The whole Chesray thing would would really be much better. Like the killing of Mario would be more impactful, and all the things that Chesray does would be more impactful if he actually had interactions with Ezio more, and they were able to talk about it. There's also the the feeling in AC2 as you uncover the conspiracy that you want to find out more about what's happening, and there's no mystery or conspiracy yeah. in Brotherhood to speak of. Everything that is hey, happening, I, the I entire disagree. Game Obvi- I I disagree, Lawson. Is the mystery whether or not Lucrezia and Cesare are actually fucking? Because other than that, there's no mystery. <laughs> no, the mystery of is Machiavelli a traitor, dude? I was on the edge of my seat. Yeah, were you? <laughs> I like that subplot too, personally. No, I, I well, I was good. joking. I'm sorry, Jacers. <laughs> No, fuck you, Jacers. We were being uh, sarcastic no, I... about liking it, which means you look silly now for legitimately liking it. Ah, you look silly. <laughs> no, you can say what I want. I I have no shame in liking that part of Brotherhood. Is it a little underwhelming? Yes, but I still. I just wish that the resolution it, so. wasn't that the actual traitor was a generic thief model because that could literally yeah, be like twelve that, or thirteen different people I interact with in this game. And un- until I'm told yeah. otherwise, I assume it is like, just give him a unique model. They can make a unique model for the random horse girl that Ezio has sex with in AC2. Remember that? Hey, so I want to. Yes. I want to ask a question. Yeah, I will allow you to ask a question. OK, so I just I, I think it could be fun. Like, I just everyone should say, like, what their favorite mission is in Brotherhood. Yes. For me, it's definitely the Coliseum mission where you dress up as the as the people in the play. Oh, yeah, that's good. That was a good one. That was fun. Even though I didn't look like someone in the play, and that confused me. <laughs> uh, stupid animus overlays. Sometimes they really get you. Um, oh, shit. We didn't talk about the modern day. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was Ooh. I was going to bring that up, but let's finish this point, and then we'll do well, I'm that. Just, I'm just going to say Tim's favorite is also my favorite. My favorite is probably uh, Castello Crasher. Word. The one where you where you rescue rescue Katarina because that's um, very interesting, the, Chasers. Like the parkour, <laughs> the parkour on that thing lets you optimize so much cool stuff. And there's like you're infiltrating this, like you're infiltrating the Vatican to go kill the Pope and his son. Like that's a really cool concept, first of all. And then the like just I found I that really mission like, to be Jank City personally. Yeah, I, I mean, again, this is coming from like my perspective. That's my sure. personal favorite. So. I'm not saying it's like the object. But you're not allowed to have that opinion. Yeah, it's not. It's against the rules. If I say it's Jank City, it's not a good mission. I suppose. I guess I'll put the <laughs> on wheels as my favorite then. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm joking. Uh, if you want me to pick a different one, probably the banker assassination. We don't actually want you to pick a different one, but I'm glad you did anyway. <laughs> you're welcome, Lawson. Should we talk about modern day? You know, we might as well. We have to, right? You know, maybe we should talk about modern day. It's better than AC2s. Yeah. So much better than AC2s. I right? agree. So much. Every single line saw Sean says, or like, not every line, but like, so many of his lines, I find myself laughing out loud, just because, like, he's a he's a really effective As I mentioned, release. this is the first game where he's likable. Yeah, he's a lot more charming and... And they brought emails back, but a lot of the emails in this game are just like... Jokes. Okay, so Sunday, Desmond is going to go into the Animus, and then Monday, Desmond is going to go into the Animus. Or, where's Tuesday. my MP3 player? Or hey guys, want any food? <laughs> well, it's 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 it, yeah. the the cutscenes that you can interact with outside of the animus are nice too because they definitely run home like some of the like 
Desmond is like, hey, how long until Abstergo launches that satellite? Yeah. You know? And he's yeah. like, hey, Sean, am I going to be able to meet the head assassins? Like, there's there's just a lot of stuff that still kind of plays up the ambiguity and also plays up mm-hmm. the main thing that's happening, which is the satellite launch, which I forgot about after this game. The fun thing about Brotherhood Modern Day to me is that it's, I mean, the, the it nails the balance between being robust and feature heavy but also telling a good story whereas like say ac3 it's yeah. more robust but the story's worse you know something like syndicate yeah. or even ac1 they're less robust but their stories are better so for brotherhood it can't be for me the best modern day on the grounds that the actual storytelling in the modern day is pretty light they're just they're they're in a place now and then they leave the place I still appreciate the fun of it. I appreciate how much it lets you do. And I appreciate how well it develops those characters that are all important. Monterigioni, really great parkour playground. Really great. Like the way they like take the parkour starters, like, okay, well, this is actually a car. Yes, yes, I I said the same thing. I love, I love the world design there. Yeah. It's like, this is what assassin's creed modern day should yes. be like at least at the very least like have something don't just have them in an office where you can like walk around well, and shit what's like, cool about that too is that the it, parkour starters even still just look normal they don't look like they don't look yeah obvious it's, yeah it's, it, it, it's cool i like it so i guess to sum it up brotherhood for me my, my take on brotherhood bad story a little aggressive on the systems ultimately feels pretty insubstantial as far as AC games go to me, even though I respect its quality as far as the, you know, the classic feel, the gameplay and, and the Ezio, you know, vibe, right. You know, good combat, good modern day, lots to love, lots to love, but ultimately not enough uh, to me to set it apart from say AC two in a meaningful enough way for me to rank it higher on my list than it currently is. I think it got lower on my list as we were talking about it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I still like it the most because, like you, like we mentioned at the start of the show, I'm a very gameplay-heavy yeah. person, and I just really love the way Brotherhood yeah. feels. So it, it'll probably be my favorite for quite a long time unless, I don't know, something crazy happens. But yeah, I, I can definitely appreciate that. You know, it's not a perfect game. There's definitely some mistakes that... Largely, I think, are just a cause of the fact that the game had a development time of 12 months. Yeah, there's things to dislike about it, a lot to like. Yeah, it was nice to rationalize my position on it because Brotherhood, to me, was all like was always, you know, one of the examples of like one of the greats. And now I think I just feel differently about it nowadays. And yeah, but obviously, there are things about it that I that I still love to this day. It's just there's a lot of things that, like you said, Jason, like there's just a lot aren't like. It's definitely like a mixed bag in the sense that there's a lot about it that I love, like the side content. And like this game is also very cinematic. The story really falls flat for me. And it's and, and it sucks because it started out so great. Yep. Alas, it's it's definitely the worst of the Ezio games, in my opinion. Uh, Yeah, I'd have to agree there for sure. I mean, obviously, that's consistent with my ranking. But yeah. As always, guys, there are things you can do to support the show. If you like listening, um, tell your friends who like Assassin's Creed uh, that there's a cool, funny podcast they can listen to about it. Leave comments, tweet us, so on and so forth. Like the video, subscribe to us, post about us on Reddit. Do, do whatever you want to do. You know, it's a free country. We, we can't stop you. You can find us on Twitter at Hookblade, and you can find us on YouTube by searching The Hookblade Podcast. I've been your host, Lawson, and I've also been the hook. And I've been other host, Timothy, <laughs> and I've been the blade. And I've been guest, Jacers, and thanks for having me on, guys. Thank you for joining us, Jacers. Thank uh, you, Jacers. Definitely, guys, check out Jacers' channel. Make sure, make, make sure you guys don't check out Jacers' channel. Yeah, that'd be bad. Thank you, as always, for listening to the Hook Blade podcast, and we will be experiencing some shocking revelations next week all right bye bye So you can use one or the other.